Greetings, and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. It's late here in 2018. We're fast approaching 2019, and that means the start of another legislative session. Um, Vermonters in the, in the November election have elected a split government. What I mean by that is we have large majorities in the legislature, the House and Senate, but we've elected also a Republican governor. And the expectation is for us to get along and do the business of the state. And where those bridges get built, we'll, we'll still secede. Uh, as George Santayana said, without a sense of history, we are doomed to repeat our mistakes. So let's hope we don't make the same mistakes over again. Uh, with that in mind, last session closed with a, a big problem and an extended session when the governor vetoed the budget. And the real issue there was there was $30 million in surplus, and the, the governor and the legislature were, were at odds over how that should be spent. Uh, the, the governor wanted that money to be used to reduce property taxes, and the legislature said, uh, the financial markets are telling us the best thing we can do with that is to put it into unfunded uh, pension obligations. Uh, we wound up spending an extra month and then came to an agreement. We kind of split the difference. And, the irony here is that later in the summer, uh, Moody's, one of the, the bond rating uh, agencies, downgraded Vermont's uh, highest ratings what we were getting, and we got downgraded a bit. And one of the reasons they said was because of the, the size of our unfunded uh, pension obligations. So it's something we need to, to take uh, into a, account as we move ahead into the next session. Uh, there, the economy may be something we have to look at as well because there are storm clouds on the economic horizon. In my second year in the legislature, we ran into the, what was called the, the Great Recession. And uh, it's taken probably a lot of the last eight to 10 years for Vermont to really recover from that. And um, what some economists are saying is we're about due for another economic correction. Let's hope. We, we can keep things stable here in Vermont. Right now, with what's happening in Washington, we're not so sure about that. And that's why it's important for us here in Vermont to stay, to stay stable, to keep steady on, and, and to let people know that we've got a, a steady hand on the rudder. There's going to be a lot of other things we'll be talking about. And today, to share and talk about that is my new district mate, Nada Hashim. Nice to see you, Mike. Good well, seeing you again. Welcome, and, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, you're looking ahead to your first session. Uh, you've started that training process yep. that, that everyone goes through. And uh, while we don't have committee assignments, you've, you've brought some ideas into this. And what's your sense of what this session will bring? It's going to be an exciting session, I think. You know, the, like you were talking about the training, you know, we went through the freshman orientation just about a month or so ago. And it's the largest class of incoming legislators, freshman legislators, since 1965. And there's a lot of young faces in there, too. And just a quick funny story, you know, I was, you know, at the beginning of the orientation, we had, you know, I was sitting around a table with other young legislators, and we were going around talking about how old we are. And you know, I just turned 30. And, you know, one of the young legislators, who I think was 23 or 24, she said to me, oh, well, you're still technically considered young. And I was like, hey, I, I, I know I am. Thank you. Thank you. It's all but, relative. Yeah, yeah. And, but, you know, the, my, my point is, is that the face of the legislature is changing. And I, I think that's a very good thing. You know, it's really important that we branch out the demographics and try to bring in as many different people from different backgrounds and different walks of life as possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to the different perspectives we'll have. And speaking of that, I think you're starting to get a flavor of what that looks like around the state, the differences that people bring depending upon where they live in their communities. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, you, you, you can't live in a bubble, you know, you, you do end up getting exposed to a lot of different folks, you know, whether you're, it's in your legislative work capacity or, you know, when you're outside of that duty, you know, you really see the different viewpoints, whether you're from Chittenden County or Franklin County or Bennington County, mm -hmm. you, there's, there's a lot of viewpoints. We might be a small state, but there's a lot of diversity when it comes to how we should run the state. Mm -hmm. I like to say that our district is probably one of the best educated and most enlightened in the state, and maybe a lot of people want to say that, but I 
as I've gotten to know the people we serve, I really believe that, and I think people bring a lot to uh, what they want from us, and, and many times they, they know a lot more about what they're talking about than we do, and can be a, a great asset in educating us about different issues. Is that something you found as going through campaigning and now preparing for session? Absolutely. You, know, you, you, you can't do the job on your own. You, know, you have to reach out to those experts. You know, I, I think that each legislator, they all have their own area of expertise. I mean, as you know, mine is law enforcement and the judicial system. But you know, if I need to talk to somebody about, let's say, Act 46 or the environment, I need to find somebody who has decades of experience and education in that. That's, I think, one of the most important things. And making sure to um, keep up that open line of communication with all your constituents, yeah. I think that's it's really important. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I think they expected of us here in Vermont much more so. Uh, was talking to a, a constituent this year who uh, hasn't lived in Vermont for that long and says that she brags to people who live in other parts of the country because she said, I just emailed my, my legislator and, and the same day I got a personal response huh. back. I didn't just get a form email saying, thank you so much for contact, yeah. contacting us. And uh, I think people do expect that of us. Oh yeah. yeah, and you definitely see when you go out to the grocery store, you run into people, yep. it's, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta add a couple extra minutes every time you go grocery shopping at the yeah. co-op or the general store because you're going to end up talking about the issues. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues that I've heard from a number of people, and part of it, I think, is because we're just down the street right now from the Brattleboro Retreat. There's a lot of people who work there, a lot of people who are um, very aware of how uh, mental health issues and addiction issues factor into uh, the, the culture we live in right now. Um, in your work, uh, certainly something you encounter, uh, I work in, in human services, and, and what I say is that really law enforcement is the first line mm -hmm. in, in many social services. Um, have you been hearing from people uh, about the, the needs in the mental health delivery system? Yes. A, a meeting that we had with a number of other legislators from Wyndham County and the, the board of HCRS, you know, one of the things that was highlighted was the need for transitional housing. And that's something I've heard in a number of different sectors, whether it's mental health or just for the general economy, is having affordable housing. In this instance, transitional housing is what was at the front it was at the forefront for HCRS during this conversation. And you know, regarding law enforcement, I mean, 95% of what we do is social work. And you know, one program that I feel has really taken off is that we have a uh, embedded HCRS worker, uh, Christine Bullard, at our mm -hmm. barracks. And she has made a tremendous impact yeah. on the folks in our area. Because sometimes, you know, even if you're a cop and you have, and you're great at um, conversing with people and talking to folks who are in a mental health crisis, sometimes just having that uniform is enough to, you know, re-traumatize somebody, just simply being, being present there. And so having a civilian social worker um, doing this work has, has made a great impact for us. Yeah, and I think it's, it's something that's spreading yes. to, to other departments and, and I think an essential piece of what can, can make our, our work easier and hopefully get people help they need, yeah. need sooner. Um, when you're working on, on patrol now, uh, have you had much experience with the retreat as well? It's yes and no. It, it's kind of a tough question to answer because, you know, usually when we encounter, I mean, this is actually, in my opinion, one of the uh, difficulties that we face. When we encounter people who are going through a mental health issue, the first stop is the hospital. And that's understandable because, you know, folks who are going through a mental health crisis, if they're struggling with addiction or, or, um, or if they've hurt themselves, then they need to go to the hospital, obviously. But that also puts a significant strain on hospital staff themselves. I mean, every time we go there, they're talking about how they have a number of beds in the emergency room that are occupied by people who are going through a mental health crisis. And their, their main concern is keeping beds for trauma victims as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there ways they're, they're 
thinking we can do better than that? I think that it comes back to the housing issue mm -hmm. where um, you know, having places where there's supervision for people, you know, after they get released from the hospital, if they do need to go to the hospital, they need to find a place where they can stay where they're under supervision if they're, you know, as George Karabakis of HCRS said, if they're high acuity, yeah. meaning that they're at a high risk of either harming themselves or relapsing into addiction, they need to be in a place where there is adequate supervision yeah. and a place where they have a roof over their head. Because, you know, going to the hospital, taking somebody who's going through a mental health crisis, taking them to the hospital, having them stay there for a couple of days, and then just pushing them out the door, that that does not help them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I get reminded about regularly when I talk with uh, people who, who provide drug and alcohol uh, <laughs> services are, is that uh, there's a lot of attention on, on what's happening f with opioids and other drugs, but that alcohol is still the most destructive drug in our society. Is that something you see in your, your other work too still? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. I was I was at a uh, drug recognition expert training just a few days ago, and the the alcohol abuse in Vermont, um, according to a 2017 survey, it, the alcohol abuse in Vermont far outweighs a number of other states um, across the United States, mm -hmm. and you know it's something we regularly see, whether it's DUIs or people who are just struggling with alcohol yeah. abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you've shared that you'd li like to be put on the House Judiciary Committee. That would be great. Um, what's the legal fixes that we can use to, to help people recognize when they break the law, whether it's because of alcohol or drugs, <coughs> but jail is not necessarily the best option. What are your thoughts on, on early interventions? And so I, I think that early education I, I think you have to take a preventative stance um, when it comes to addiction, just prevent it from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we're looking down the road and somebody has become addicted to drugs, whether it's because they were over-prescribed by a doctor, I mean, I've, a, a number of folks I've encountered um, have become injured, let's say in the line of work, like carpenters or builders of any sort. You know, let's say they fall off a ladder, they break their leg, they get over-prescribed opioids then they end up off of those opioids after they've rehabbed themselves, but now they're addicted to one of the most strongest drugs out there. And you know, that individual may end up finding themselves living a life that they did not expect to live. And they'll find themselves you know, burglarizing homes in order to feed their addiction. Yeah. And you know, of course, that individual, if they get arrested, you know, they have to make reparations, they have to remedy the fact that they've, you know, violated the sanctity of somebody's home and taken things to sell, and they have to make reparations for that. But being addicted to drugs solely should not be punished. Mm -hmm. Now, we're, we're right across the hall from the Community Justice Center here. Uh, is that a place where we need to use more? Absolutely, I, I think so, especially for nonviolent crimes. Yeah. Um, I've actually met with the Brattleboro uh, Restorative Justice and the uh, Bellas Falls Restorative Justice, yeah. and you know they've they've got a lot of, a lot of great ideas, and they're also very enthusiastic, and there's a lot of energy there to yeah. keep going forward with their work. Yeah, there's a um, a Vermont documentary out right now, uh, which talks about the whole process of, of restorative justice, and especially highlights what gets used the the COSAs, the circles of support and accountability uh, and from what I'm understanding there's great great outcomes when somebody gets that group of people that sit down with them on a regular basis and help keep them on track it helps them move along um, is that something we need more of uh, to help people who don't have those supports necessarily in their lives I, I think so I mean there is a high recidivism rate I think it's 72 percent for for state prison, and I, I don't want to see a revolving door on our prisons with people going in and then coming out, but then not having that support system, finding themselves back in poverty, and then f or back into addiction, 
and then they're back committing crimes again. That nobody, nobody wins in that situation. You bet. Well, you mentioned prisons, mm -hmm. and there's certainly a lot of concern in Vermont and across the nation. Uh, we have a high rate of people incarcerated. Um, where they are when they're Vermont prisoners is another concern. Is that something you're looking to, to take, uh, take a stand on in, in the next session? Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you asked because that's actually the first bill that I've submitted. I, I'm strongly opposed to privatized prisons and I'm also opposed to sending Vermonters out of state to privatized prisons. It's, so just to get back to the, the, my, the, the bill that I submitted is a preemptive move to prevent the future creation or establishment of any privatized prisons in this state. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I believe that if somebody commits a crime and they're convicted in court, that is, well, one, it's an affront to the society they live in, but also it's that society's responsibility to remedy the issue and to make sure, ideally, that that person doesn't end up committing a crime again. You know, it's, you, you don't want to put a temporary Band-Aid on something and then just have it start happening over and over again. I, you know, the, the thing that bothers me is that we refer to ourselves as the land of the free, but we have the highest incarceration rate, you know, compared to other authoritarian countries. Prison, prison is not always the answer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, look forward to being able to work on that. I think it's a great idea. Thank um, you. In the similar realm, uh, Vermont's changing like the rest of the nation is. Um, the landscape, let's say, is uh, the demographics are getting more colorful. <laughs> this is a good thing. Uh, however, Vermont struggles uh, in many ways that this change is not going fast enough and in some places too fast. Well, something we've talked about, how do we open the doors to take a look at overt bias, implicit bias? How do we make Vermont a more racially welcoming place? Um, ideas on that? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar question. I mean, you know, the, the conversation we had recently, you know, we, as you remember, we at the Putney Library with Lieutenant Scott with the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee. You know, I, I opened by saying that talking about race is one of the most uncomfortable things to discuss. You know, no matter what color your skin is, it, it can make you uncomfortable. And the thing is, is that it's okay to be uncomfortable because sometimes these critical issues require making yourself vulnerable or uncomfortable to talk about so that we can move forward. You know, when it comes to implicit bias, it, it affects a variety of things, not just race. I mean, when, when you see somebody driving a 2018 Mercedes, you make a snap judgment about who that person might be. That's an example of implicit bias. Or if you see you know, a person of color, an African-American walking down the street at 11 o'clock at night, and you're also walking down the street, and you instinctively become afraid for reasons that you can't understand why, that's also implicit bias. So it spans a large array of um, different aspects in life. How we can make Vermont more appealing um, to people from different walks of life, I, really I think the number one thing is affordable housing. That's one of the things that I've gone back to you know, over the last few months. It's a recurring theme that I've noticed. You know, if you want people to lead a happy life and you know, be able to send their kids to the good schools that we have, the first and most important thing they need is a roof over their head, a place to sleep and a place to put their things. Yeah. One of the things uh, Curtis Reed talks about, though, is, is the economic doors that need to open as well. And, yeah. uh, I think he's, he, he's spot on there as well, is that that's the place where we can be as welcoming and we need to do more uh, to have our workplaces do that. And I think they're holding that up right here in the town of Brattleboro mm -hmm. to make it more inclusive. So. Uh, as we go along, you and I have talked about uh, what we'd like to do is, is encourage more community conversations like yeah. we just had at the Putney Library. Uh, among legislators, many of us have been talking about and reading the, the book White Fragility, uh, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. Uh, I think it's one of those books that gets us out of the comfort zone that you just talked about. Yeah. And it's, it's time. you know the, the faces of America are changing again, uh, and it's time we realize that. When you look at the demographics of Vermont, 
we still have a, a small adult population. But if you look at our schools, yeah. uh, our schools are, are growing much faster, and, and that's the next generation come up, coming up. And we certainly want to be welcoming to everybody. So um, looking ahead, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're going to be able to look at that work. Um, some other things that are, that are coming up, just reading about how vaping, hmm. the numbers are staggering now of teens that are vaping. You think that's the role of government to get involved there? Gosh, I well, when it comes to the health and safety aspect of it for you know, our our next generation of Vermonters, then yes, I mean yeah. we have we have rules regarding tobacco use and alcohol use, and I get that rules get broken sometimes by different folks, but we we have to make sure that we understand the effects of vaping and you know make sure that the people who choose to do it also understand the effects of vaping because you know we the vaping companies the people who make money off of this they're not going to come right out and say these are the dangers this is the research we've done of course they're going to say yeah it's safe everything's fine yeah and that's what we've been hearing yeah it is banned i think to age 18 i think there's going to be a push to to raise that to 21 uh for cigarettes as well yeah i think the It'll be lives saved, money saved, but it, it's going to be hard to, to change that. It'll definitely be cost saving <coughs> down the road with, yeah. with the diseases that develop from tobacco use as well. Yeah. When, when we were at the conference in, in, in Washington, D.C. recently, um, one of the issues that came up in several areas was, was Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. and the concerns that with the current administration in Washington uh, and the Supreme Court that's now sitting there, uh, that these uh, legal services that have been available to women for decades now are at risk. So within Vermont's legislative leadership, that's something that they hope to put on the, the fast track for constitutional amendment and to put it into statute. Uh, any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm really glad that they're planning to do that. You know, it's, what, what it comes down to is preserving bodily autonomy. and. We, we do need to see it codified into law, and we do need to protect it. And I, I, I do feel like it's threatened, especially with the recent confirmation of um, Brett Kavanaugh as well. So I'm, I'm glad we're doing that. Yeah, yep. That certainly highlighted the realities of uh, what women go through and have been raising their voices with the Me Too movement. Yeah. That these are cultural shifts parallel to what's happening uh, racially that we really need to raise our awareness and, and how we treat each other. So we've got a few minutes left and here's your magic wand. Uh, they'll probably, by the end of this session in two years, there'll probably be about uh, over a thousand bills that will be introduced. Oh really? And, wow. and maybe 200 of them will pass and half of those will be kind of bread and butter mandatory things around, around town charters and stuff like that. Let's say you could get three bills through there uh, what's something that you would feel good, what would be a good accomplishment to, to finish the session? Let's see, so three bills. Number one would be the privatized prison bill that I already talked about. Number two, we have to raise the minimum wage as well to $15 an hour by 2024. You know, I think I, there, there's a lot of concern <coughs> from small businesses, which I understand I would never want to do anything that would harm our small businesses, but I think we have to look at the holistic view. When people have more money in their pockets, they spend that money at our small Locally. businesses, exactly. Yeah. And I, I wanna see folks spending more money at our small businesses to make sure that they are stable and that they're able to continue participating in the mainstream economy. And I also wanna see folks you know, not stressing out as much when they're working two or three jobs. I mean, I've met so many people who are working two or three jobs and they still can barely make ends meet because of the affordability. Now, I'd also like to see us do something more regarding affordable housing. I mean, I know I've been harping on that subject, and, but if, if we can do something that allows for um, the more creation of affordable housing in Vermont, that's something I'm behind. You bet. I know locally the, the Wyndham Windsor Housing yes. Trust has done some amazing work, and certainly we need to continue to support them 
and, and the VHCB, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, which, which is a pass-through for funding there. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's very important to uh, our constituents is how they get in touch with us, mm -hmm. uh, how they stay in contact, and it's important for us to be their conduit to, to what's happening in Montpelier. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, best way is probably Facebook. I'm, I'm on there, and if you just search Nader Hashim, there's not a lot of Nader Hashims in Vermont. You'll, you'll see my name pop up. Uh, you can also call me or text me at 802-490-5823 or drop me an email at hashimwindham4, and that's the number four, at gmail.com. And then once the session starts, you'll get your legislative email exactly, as yeah. well. And all that information is on the will be on the legislative website. Um, in, in closing, I just want to add that uh, you know, we're certainly talking a lot about Act 46. There were two lawsuits filed this week, uh, and I think it was telling that one of the lawyers said this is just a really badly written law. And uh, we'll see how the courts feel about that, too, as we're trying to do what's best for our kids and, and do what's best for democracy as well. And there's some real challenges that have risen up out of that. I'm certainly concerned about um, continued gun violence in this country and, and going to be looked to looking to extend waiting periods of 72 hours. Yeah. We know that in domestic violence and suicide situations, a waiting period can save lives. And uh, we're going to be working towards that as well. And there's going to be lots to do, lots to say. And uh, as we go through the session, we'll, we'll be checking in and, and continuing to report to our constituents. And likewise, my contact information is, is going to be on the screen, as they usually do here. And, uh, my email will, will be there, and it's on the legislative website, too. Uh, I also want to take the time to thank you for watching and for all the people here at, at BCTV. Uh, as you may have heard, there's some challenges happening to, to community television across the country, and especially right here. Uh, what we're asking people to do is contact our federal delegation, Congressman Welch and Senators Sanders and Leahy, to, to see if we can't change these FCC rules that could possibly do away with the programming you're see, seeing right here and, and the people at BCTV. We want to keep this going and they need your support. Uh, I, hope this, I don't want to make this sound like a pledge drive, but in lots of ways they're, they're going to need our support and we want to keep this kind of programming coming to you. So thanks to all the people at BCTV. Thank you for, for letting us into your lives for a little bit and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.